Our next speaker, our next speaker is uh, Bartos Novak. He's a media sales professional, having collected years of experience in both digital radio and television and non-digital outdoor media. He's set foot in the overwhelming online world and is more than happy to be an integral part of Spiderweb's group as its head of sales. He used to be an English, t an English teacher in his past. Uh, he remains a devoted Arsenal football club fan, which he uses often as an excuse to go to London more than anyone think would be res reasonable. Please welcome on stage... Bartosz Novak. <laughs> Yeah, if there are any Chelsea fans on this <coughs> in the auditorium, please forgive me. Um, where I come from is the online world. And the online world I represent is Spidersverse Group, which is nowadays the biggest independent tech blog in the country. But it's not has been the case for me all the time. Before I arrived at Spidersverse, I used to work in several different places, all of them connected to media, and the journey that I've been going through and I hope to continue throughout foreseeable future is something I want to share with you today. And in the aspect of how technology has changed the journey throughout the years. What I will be talking to you about today will be somewhat strange, I hope somewhat funny, but most of all, I hope interesting. But first of all, let me tell you something about me. If you want to know something about me, all you have to do is buy the book, which should be on the market any minute. I mean, any minute I have the inspiration and time to write it, and any minute any publisher crazy enough uh, will be found to publish it. But... Uh, Getting a bit serious. We're here in Krakow, Krakow, which is a sentimental city for me because I've spent 10 years of my life in the city. Uh, both of my kids, aged 13 and 16, were born here. Uh, all of this is legitimate because I've been happily married for 17 years to the same woman. And I've been working in media for 18 years. All of this again finds an excuse in the fact that I'm 42 years of age. I've been working for out-of-home media company. I've been working for radio stations, TV stations, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I now represent an online medium. But the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about the media journey, the media journey of Bartosz Novak I'm about to write about in the book I mentioned, is year 2000. When I started working for Stroer Out of Home Media, which is one of the, I think, largest companies of this sort in Poland right now, and I have to say, these were really, really digitally challenged times. Because what you see on the screen is, as far as I remember the name correctly, Sony Mavica digital camera, who was equipped with a 2.5 megabytes floppy disk which could only collect up to five photographies uh, of quality good enough to be shown to the public. Most of my work as a sales and development representative was based on a map like this, because Google Maps, I don't know whether you remember, were introduced as far as I collect January or February 2005. So me, as a sales representative, had to work print and pen. So if there was a client who wanted to buy an advertising campaign from Strahl, I had to put him in a car, give him a piece of paper and pen into his hand, drive around the city, show him all the possible outdoor advertising carriers that we had in our portfolio, and he was choosing it one by one. Meetings took from 10 to 12 hours per one client at that time. And I thought that this was difficult enough, so my bosses came up with the idea that it will be much easier for me to do so if the clients were provided with some sort of a database. And I was asked to provide 
the database. At that time, there were, I think, about 2,000 carriers uh, in the Stroyer portfolio here in Krakow. So I had to go to each one of them, photograph one, each of them, then collect all the data and put it into a Microsoft Access file, which I don't know whether you remember at that time was not a very reliable source of information. What happens nowadays is that the database of every outdoor company is out there for everyone, for you, for me, for the client. It contains all the detailed information, all the people around the world collected. So if a company wants to advertise via Strer, all they have to do is get a login and a password, and they have immediate access to anything they want to buy. So they can see the preview, they can choose the carriers instantly, they can, any, they can make any arrangements flexible enough both for them and for the company. So something that took at least 10 to 12 hours per day right now takes up to 60 minutes. Then I changed my place of work and I started working for a radio station, again here in Krakow. It used to play all the music from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and it's still there on the market, probably uh, bearing the proud name of Złote Przeboje. And um, what we used back then to sign orders with the clients were fax machines. All the orders for quite large amounts of money were written once. And if that wasn't difficult enough, there was the case of the commercial spots that need to be aired on the radio station in order for the campaign to be working. These were produced in a quite professional studio in the center of Krakow next to the railway station, but we were the professional ones. Not much of a case with the clients. As I remember correctly, about 20% of the clients had computers back then. So, if I received an MP3 file containing a commercial, whether it was 15, 20 or 30 seconds, it didn't really matter, all I could do was phone the client and put the headset next to the speaker and this how the commercials were accepted. Most of the times, of course, there was confusion because the quality was not good enough. And sometimes it took 15 to 20 corrections for a commercial to be aired. As if that was not enough, it was not the case that after the commercial was accepted, it was all done. No. We had to manually upload it to the system and then run to the G DJ who was hosting a program and going like this. Reload. And this was the guy who was sitting in a booth thick glass between us. So after a couple of weeks, one of the reporters came up with the idea that we should just have uh, regular prepared banners with particular signs what the DJ was supposed to do. Then somebody in the station came up with a brilliant idea that we don't have to do it during the day. Of course, we can do it during the night. So all the salesmen we're supposed to do it from home via their computers. Some of us even received laptops from the company. And this is how the thing was done. And this was the year 2002. I stopped working for the radio station in 2006, if I remember correctly. And then I went to another company. But before I tell you about the television, I will tell you how the radio works right now. Right now, one person from the Kościuszko Mount can do anything from one desk. They have access to tools, they have access to analysis. If there is one person who is a traffic manager, he or she can plan an advertising campaign in one, two, 12, 13, or even 100 radio stations from this place alone. This gives them multi-channel options, and this gives them solutions 
I could never dream of. What's most important for the clients, it now has become truly cost effective. Before then, it was somewhat impossible. Now, about the TV adventure. Uh, it was 2006, and I went to work for a TV station, and it seems quite impossible and quite hard to believe right now, but in 2006, all the commercials to TV stations were delivered on videotapes, which just gives us the idea of what the risk was, that the tape was damaged, that the material was not arable, as we said, in the company. And what's most interesting, that if you wanted to copy it to the system, it had to be done in real time. So all the materials, and there were about 200 to 300 commercials being delivered to the TV station per day. There was one person, then two, three, up to 10 person team who had to copy all of that put it in the system and then check it, of course. Being at a videotape, there was zero tolerance for any mistakes or errors that were on the commercials. So if anything was wrong, if the sound was bad, if the picture was bad, if there was something illegal, because these were the cases as well, all we had to do was just call the client and said, sorry, not this time. There was no time for adjustments. And it might be quite difficult to believe, but Microsoft Access was still present at that time. And the huge sales database of a multi-million TV advertising business was based on Microsoft Access. And the software built to air the commercial was based on it as well. So many of my traffic colleagues had this saying, yeah, we booked it, but um, September, and November, it doesn't matter. It will go out sometime. Then came a time where software was delivered, finally delivered in a proper manner. So if you enter, for example, TV and media, uh, I think the largest advertising uh, TV uh, bureau uh, at this point in time uh, in Poland. If you go to their website, what you immediately see is a customized platform. Again, like Storer, you can log on to it, you can see what's available, you can see whether your material has been uploaded, whether there are, s there are any corrections to be made, whether it's accepted, whether it's uh, ready to be aired. So it takes a lot less time than in the past. The same goes with the orders. These are two separate platforms from the same TV company. Uh, they've introduced advanced sales solutions, which thankfully uh, give all the advertisers time they need. It costs them less money, which they need as well to be used properly. So what they came up with is the idea that there is no longer the need to have as much time and as many people and spend as much money as they used to. They even took it a step further. And there are products, thanks to the analysis they have, that they can provide demographically, geographically. So if there's anyone who wants to advertise on a TV station and wants his or her campaign to be urged to men, women of different age, different professional status, it's all possible. But now we're online. I mean, we're online, right? We are online on and on again. And what my life from my personal experience looks like right now is that all I have to do is be able to use three, in some cases, four software tools, whether it's Google Analytics, whether it's uh, the Google Ad Manager, this is the same tool that we use, is that there's still s uh, circles as uh, double click. Uh, Google AdSense, if somebody wants to use it, we don't. And uh, 
the software which is provided by the Polish company, uh, Gemius, that allows us to see what website performs, how, within which target groups. Again, all the, dat all the data we have. All of them are what is most important for me and for my colleagues as well, because we speak about it quite often, is that they are user-friendly. And three out of these four, apart from Gemius Explorer, are free applications. So it's a tool that Google has introduced in order for ma to make the life of people like me much, much easier. It provides fast analysis. It allows us to plan campaigns in a much simpler way than before. And what's most important is to be accurate, something that I could only dream of a decade ago. So a decade of time, not so much, but a truly dynamic change in the profession that I have the pleasure of representing. Now, if I was to summarize what changes technology has brought into my professional life, I would have to divide them into four categories. I've already mentioned accuracy, but if I had to put anything on the spot in the first place, I would say people. Because the human factor now allows us to work shorter hours, more effective hours, and brings us to number two on the list, which is time. The same people can do much more work and do it much better, which is quite important, in less time. And all of these combined allow for the professionals to cost less money and to use them in a much better way. All of these come to one point, which is effectiveness. Whether it's human effective, cost effective, or time effective, all of these changes that have been introduced, I say have been because I know that they're being done right as we speak, allowed for any advertising media professional to use the time and health much better than it used to be in the past. So if anyone asks me ever, what's the difference between 2000 and 2018 in my professional life, of course, in the area of technology, I would say that it may have been 18 years on paper, but it was a couple of centuries for me as far as advertising professional. This is it for me. If there will be any questions later on, if I have said something that is interesting or you would like to dwell upon a bit later, I will be more than happy to answer these questions. But right now, that's it for me. Thank you very much. You want to use mine? Can I? Yeah, sure. We'll, just, we'll stand like this. Is that all right? <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> it's the first time we met. That's just, <laughs> that's just gorgeous. Uh, so can you, can you tell us about oh, yes. the crazy advertisement which is being sent to radio or TV? Yes, I can. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can. Oh. It was during the radio days. And one of the furniture stores, quite large ones here in Krakow, decided that they want to bomb the market with cut prices. They didn't have the idea that Norman Schwarzkopf, an American general, by the way, had an idea for the same day to bomb Iraq. Um, this was the only case that I took my personal decision to get the campaign of the air. Uh, luckily, the client thought the same and <laughs> uh, they decided to award, award the radio station with additional budget for the next quarter. It's beautiful. The next question, how is the efficiency of a commercial measured in radio and TV? Um, 
It's a question for me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, right now, uh, there is a company called SMG KRC, and there is plenty of people who are actually, up till now, calling a couple of thousand people every month, and they gather and collect all the information on their lives, behaviors, age, professional status, and so on. So this is how it works. And this is the data that all the radio station can then access and use to provide the accurate advertising campaigns. Uh, I really want to know the answer to the next question. What were some of the illegal adverts that you refused to air? Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> want to choose one? <laughs> um, most of them are not the regular 30-second commercial adver advertising campaigns, but the sponsorship ones. Uh, there are very strict rules in Poland as far as sponsoring any TV programs. Uh, first of all, there's only eight, second of eight seconds of time for any advertiser to use it. Second of all, uh, there is the strict one uh, rule that it has to be an information and most of all, the most difficult one is the ones that it cannot promote anything. So it's quite difficult and tough for a client to understand that he pays for something, but doesn't promote much at the same time. So uh, car companies, financial companies, and I think some of the uh, beer producing companies were the ones who had the most trouble. So th th these were the ones we had to refuse pretty, pretty often. Because even though I said that we can access the materials right away, they decide to just upload it and think, oh, maybe they won't notice. This is <laughs> the policy. But the problem and the trouble is that it is the medium that is responsible, not the sponsor. Yeah. So if there was a lawsuit, someone comes to the CEO of a TV station and, say, and says, hey, it's not good. And then we have to go to the client and say the same thing and get money from them. Okay. Please, everybody, give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs>